Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in a three-part series focused on the important role of early literacy in equity-driven teaching and learning. My name is Claire Abbott, and I'm the Director of the Office of Educator Effectiveness at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education here in Massachusetts. Before we jump into this important and powerful conversation about literacy, I want to pause and acknowledge the context within which we are all living and working right now. Once again, our nation's schools have been struck with tragedy. Last week, a school in Denver, Colorado, experienced a deadly shooting. And just today, the Nashville community is mourning the loss of at least three students and three adults. This violence is unrelenting and the harm it does to our communities and our society can feel overwhelming. I know that all of our hearts are with these schools and their families today as we work to create safer places for our children to learn and to thrive. So please join me in a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Here at DESE, we are committed to supporting the preparation development and celebration of teachers and leaders who make a difference for the 1 million students in our schools. If you're joining us today, it is likely because you too know the importance of literacy when it comes to ensuring that all students have what they need to thrive. Teaching kids to read, to write, and to engage with one another and with the world is literally the key to their future and the pathway to a rich and fulfilling life full of opportunity. And yet, as we emerge from the pandemic, we are seeing literacy outcomes for Massachusetts students fall even farther, with 59% of students in third through fifth grade not meeting grade level expectations, and almost one third of all third through eighth graders scoring zero points on the MCAS writing assessment, a historic low. Racial disparities in these outcomes have not only persisted, but have widened and it's our collective responsibility to change this trajectory. That's why we are working so hard here in Massachusetts to set a strong foundation for instructional practices in early literacy that are evidence-based, culturally responsive, and linguistically sustaining. You can read more about the statewide mass literacy initiative on our website, the link to which we will drop into the chat, as well as new expectations for early literacy instruction in teacher preparation programs that will go into effect in 2024. For this webinar series, we are going to go more deeply into what's at the heart of this work. Why evidence-based early literacy is so essential to building a truly equitable society. How educators can teach kids to read and write in a culturally responsive manner and what instruction looks like in schools and classrooms that reflect the linguistic diversity of our many communities. Each webinar features key voices and stakeholders in the world of early literacy, including leaders from Massachusetts teacher preparation programs, national experts and thought leaders, and of course, Massachusetts teacher leaders. We are deeply honored and grateful to them for dedicating their time and their expertise over the next few weeks. In today's webinar, we will be delving into the why, why early literacy is such an essential tool for equity. And before I turn it over to our moderator and our amazing panel, I wanna thank the Hunt Institute for their partnership in developing these webinars, each of which will be recorded and published on our website. And I want to encourage participants to listen to the conversation as it unfolds and to share questions for our panelists using the Q&A feature of the Zoom platform. We will reserve time toward the end of the discussion to elevate some of these questions for our panelists. And now I am honored to introduce the moderator for today's conversation, Dr. David Chard. Dr. Chard is the Dean of Boston University Wheelock College of Education and Human Development, which includes educator preparation programs from early childhood to special education and more. Under his leadership, the college has become host to several prominent research centers and institutes, including the National Center to Improve Literacy and the Wheelock Education Policy Center. Dr. Chard has more accolades than I can name in the fields of special education and literacy, earned over decades of contributions to teaching and learning. Welcome, Dr. Chard. 
thank you for leading this important conversation. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for setting the stage for our discussion today and for mentioning the tragic events um, of the past two weeks. Um, I, it's My job is to um, first thank the Hunt Institute and uh, our own state of Massachusetts for hosting these webinars and for bringing uh, amazing people to this conversation. So I, I want to uh, express my gratitude for that. I'm also deeply honored to um, be able to kick this one off. And I'm a bit of a fanboy of our of some of our panelists. So um, I'll have to admit that up front. Um, you mentioned decades of work. I think, you know, the interesting thing to me is that we've been striving for equity in education for a very long time. In fact, since the Johnson administration, we've had uh, efforts to try to improve literacy outcomes for um, all children. And yet we are still having the same conversation and in some ways struggling with the same issues. And what I'd like to do uh, today is um, introduce the panel. Uh, our, our primary goals today are to draw a connection between effective teaching of early literacy foundations and equitable outcomes. And then also to talk about misconceptions that evidence-based instruction is somehow antithetical to social justice and the advocacy we feel as educators for that. Um, so let me begin by introducing the panel, and then I want to ask the panelist a fundamental question. So first, we have Kareem Weaver, a co-founder and executive director of Fulcrum, which partners with stakeholders to improve reading results for students. Kareem is also Oakland NAACP's second vice president and chair of its education committee. Prior to his current role, he was an award-winning teacher and administrator in Oakland, California and Columbia, South Carolina. His extensive advocacy and passion for evidence-based literacy instruction is currently featured in the film, The Right to Read, which some of you may have been able to see recently. Our second panelist is Monroe Richardson, Executive Director of Read Charlotte, a community literacy initiative that unites educators, community partners, and families to improve children's reading from birth to third grade, with a focus on using research and data to discover how to improve early literacy outcomes. Dr. Richardson works to help community partners as evidence use evidence-informed knowledge, practices, resources, and/or models in their work to improve early literacy for all. And our final panelist is Jennifer Hogan, a K-6 English language arts humanities curriculum coordinator here in Massachusetts in the Pentucket Regional School District. Prior to joining Pentucket, Ms. Hogan served as a reading specialist for Lynn Public Schools and a literacy fellow at Marblehead Public Schools. She's also a Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education literacy champion and an expert in evidence-based literacy instruction. So welcome panelists, it's great to see you all. Uh, at the outset, I just uh, want to let our audience know I'm gonna be calling you by first names um, just to make things easy and uh, be a little less formal. So I appreciate your, your willingness to, uh, to allow me to do that. But I wanna ask this question. I was thinking about it in preparation for today. What, what is it? What is equity? What are we talking about? And I wanna ask each of you to define it so that we understand the perspective you're taking as we dive into some of these important questions. So Kareem, I'm gonna, Kareem, I'm gonna start with you. Um, define equity for us from your perspective. Well, I'm, I'm glad you started with that question because it really is fundamental to everything you're talking about. It, it's not holding hands and singing kumbaya as all our kids go over the cliff. Um, that's not it. Um, equity means in this context of literacy that you're taking the actions, learning and applying um, the methods and implementing the policies and choosing curricula that's going to get the greatest number of kids reading possible in tier one. I know there's, you know, you hear people say there's no one way to teach reading, and they're actually right. Um, but we're, we're creating a system to be equitable. That means we're going to maximize our offering free and appropriate public education, like get the outcomes we want, like maximize the ratio of success. And we don't we don't wait for kids to fail and respond to challenges um, before they metastasize, so to speak. Um, I provide those kids who aren't successful in tier one with access to evidence-based support and the least restrictive. A long-winded answer, but that's what equity is in this context. Okay, thank you. Kareem, we're having a little bit of um kind of a garbling sound from your mic. So let me uh, shift to Monroe on this question and maybe you can 
see if there's a way to correct that. Monroe? David, thanks for the question. Um, so I, I think about equity in the context of our work um, as getting to the place where race and socioeconomics no longer predicts outcomes, whether they be education outcomes or social outcomes. And so the question is, how do the actions that we take in the classroom and in all of the adjacent places weaken the relationship between race and socioeconomics and the educational and social outcomes that we all care about? Okay, I, I'm hearing a theme here. So Jen, to you. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And um, I'll follow up with what Kareem and Monroe were saying. And I'm so honored to be sharing a space with such brilliant minds. But for me, and from the district perspective, equity is removing those barriers to success for all students, right? And so Kareem touched on what some of those barriers might be within the context of literacy, right? Whether it's within tier one, whether it's programming that you're choosing, whether it's professional development you're providing, and the structures and systems you have for your students, or you know, whether the barriers are within the context of socioeconomics or race or students with disabilities, but it's our job to level that field and remove those barriers for all students so that all students can succeed. They all have the opportunity and they all have a chance to really be successful. So not if you agree, what I hear is we're talking about equitable outcomes and that methods, policies, implementation approaches may differ depending on context and student need. Fair? Okay, okay. I just wanna make sure we're, we're all on the same page and the audience knows the lens through which we're, we're viewing this. So I suspect this will come up as we move forward with questions. I have, I have specific questions for each of you and um, some of my social media uh, followers have been, you know, he hearing me say how excited I am about this particular conversation. Um, so, Kareem, I, are you ready for the next question, or shall I? I think I'm ready for it. Okay. Yeah, you sound you sound a lot clearer. We'd love to see your face, though. <laughs> Here, here's the question. So, why do you think explicit direct instruction on phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension? is sometimes positioned as antithetical to social justice in our field. Hmm. Well, I think of two, two reasons. One, there's a cultural element. Um, we have learner's bias. Many of us in education are, um, you know, if you look at Nancy Young's ladder of, of reading, we would be in that upper tier, the 5% or at most the 35% who can learn either on our own or a number of different ways. And so for us, uh, for those who learn like that, oftentimes our reference point is a more dynamic style, some would say, um, and, and they, it, it, it seems diminishing to force something more restrictive in that mindset on students, not realizing that that's actually the very thing that we need to reach the majority of students. And then equity says that in order to get the greatest number of kids reading possible, we got to do what they need. And that's exactly what you laid out, a systematic, direct, explicit instruction in tier one, but our own learner's bias, our own frame of reference betrays us. And the second thing is our lack of honest connection to the consequences of our philosophies, our ideas, our whatever our professional or personal take is. When you, either yourself or you have a child or you have a loved one who experiences the opposite side of our refusal to do those things, our lack of commitment to it, especially at, this, at the post-secondary level and, and even K-12, um, you, get, you, you get straight real quick when you have people who are, you know, what, however life has unfolded for them and you see the inflection points and you're able to walk it back to realize, oh, it started with instruction in how to read. So I, I think that disconnect um, allows us to come up with you know, how many angels dance on the head of a pin, these esoteric arguments that really don't, that really don't um, honor the impact of, of, of what's at stake. Just a quick follow. So I, that's very powerful. We lack the connection to the consequences. And um, we'll get to the consequences in a minute, I believe. But isn't that a sort a, a very positive double-edged sword though, right? So if, if we understand the, con the negative consequences a lack of instruction can have, 
then we also know there's a very positive consequences that solid, effective instruction can have as well. Right, right? that's true. Uh, it's all about awareness. And, uh, and you know, there's, there are different kinds of awareness. We can read a report. There's a white paper, I'm sure, being written right now somewhere. <laughs> um, we, you know, we can see something on the news. And then there's something to be said about looking in a loved one's eye, knowing how intelligent they were coming up, but realizing they just didn't get what they needed. Yeah. And while society may assign them the title of never do well, you know, based on your connection, your relation, your engagement, your love for that person, they're just as intelligent. You know, I'm sure Steve Jobs' mother, you know, he was dyslexic. I'm sure she probably said, oh, this is a smart boy, you know. Um, and, and so that lack of personal connection um, really is kind of blinding yeah. and obscures the opportunities that you mentioned um, that we have when we engage all of our, our residents and citizens in the opportunity to learn how to read. Thank you, Kareem. Powerful. Um, Monroe, let me let me come to you. There seems to be uh, less information about these consequences that Kareem referenced and um, and the later outcomes of proficient reading from early elementary school. Last year, you commissioned a study on the relationship between early reading proficiency and later life experiences based in your work in Charlotte. Tell us a little bit more about that study and those findings, and how can we understand that relationship between and the benefit of educator preparation programs in particular that focus on equity? Yes, happy to. Um, so as an intermediary organization here in Charlotte, North Carolina, a good part of our work involves convincing people that improving reading during the first eight years of a child's life makes a big impact on their later chances in life, um, particularly for economic and social mobility. So, but it's one thing to make a moral argument. It's another to have hard data. And so last year, we, as you mentioned, commissioned some researchers at UNC Chapel Hill to help us build an even stronger case. And so the researchers analyzed a longitudinal data set uh, and it was from the 1979 National Longitudinal Survey of Youth that were able to link mothers to their adult offspring. So we had over 6,600 6, children in the data set from birth up through um, about their mid-20s, um, 20 different uh, points in time the data was collected. And moreover, we also had rich demographic uh, child development household information data. So we were able to account for or control for other factors that could also have an impact on later outcomes and maybe explain those as well. So um, what did we find? Well, in short, the researchers at Chapel Hill found that reading proficiency in grades three and four actually provides protection across a range of social outcomes that we all care about. So um, education, finances, health, and risky behaviors. And in fact, they found that getting children to proficiency in reading by grades three and four had the biggest impact on children who start school at the lowest reading levels. In other words, we're talking about really how early literacy can help level the playing field. So uh, they, they made a lot of findings, but as an example, just to illustrate for us today, let's compare the impact of being below average in reading in grades three and four versus being above average. Now here in North Carolina, where I'm at, we think this loosely corresponds to the difference say between being not proficient and college and career ready. And in Massachusetts, I think you can think of this as loosely corresponding to either not meeting or partially meeting expectations versus meeting or exceeding expectations. So to um, help us all uh, see what I'm gonna talk about, we put together an infographic that I just put on the screen and we'll share this so everyone can have access to it. Um, and, and remember, uh, I'm just gonna go through the highlights here. Keep in mind that we are controlling for a wide range of individual and household differences um, so that we're really trying to get at what is the impact of, of reading proficiency in third and fourth grade. And again, remember, we're comparing, we're looking at children who are below average compared to their peers who are above average or 
um, meeting or exceeding expectations. So here's what they found. A child who is below average in those bottom levels uh, are almost twice as likely to not apply to college. They are more than twice as likely to not graduate from college. They have 25% less household income in their early to mid 20s. They're almost 50% more likely to experience unemployment in their 20s. They are 25% more likely to report substance abuse in their 20s and are one third more likely to report feelings of depression in their 20s. So as Kareem said, connecting, making the connections to the consequences of, of not helping these children reach their God-given potential um, clearly shows that what happens in K-3 classrooms matters a great deal. Uh, the future of our communities and our country depends greatly upon the quality of reading instruction that our children receive. And this starts with the quality of preparation for reading instruction that our educators receive as undergraduates in teacher preparation programs. Great, Monroe, thank you for sharing the graphic and for sharing the study, for drawing the connections that Kareem uh, uh, laid out for us those consequences that oftentimes we don't see because we're working with children when they're young and don't understand where those where those are going. And, and most importantly, for linking it to the preparation of teachers. I think that's really, really, really critical. Jen, let me move to you um, and let's bring this home to Massachusetts as someone who works here in the Commonwealth. Um, my question to you is, as a leader and advocate in your district uh, for evidence-based literacy instruction, what has been the driver for change? What has what has worked to begin to shift uh, the kind of instruction that's happening that we think will result in, the, the evidence would suggest will result in equitable outcomes? Yeah, thank you. So let me preface this with, it's always a work in progress, right? So this is something that we've been doing within the Pentucket Regional School District for a number of years now. This isn't change that happens overnight as much as I wish that it could. Um, it's something I think we'll be working on, you know, as long as I'm in education, like we addressed in the beginning, we've been talking about this for a long time. But for us, the, the main driver of change, you know, as it should be with anything that we're doing in education is the students first, right? So Monroe mentioned data, and we're also looking at data within our district. We're looking at valid and reliable literacy assessment data, especially for student subgroups who historically have been behind. So that includes, you know, students that are learning English as another language, students with disabilities. We have to identify those inequities that we're seeing and recognize that we have the knowledge and the research to be able to close those gaps for these students and close them more efficiently than we have in the past. Um, and actually we can prevent these gaps from developing at all for most kids when we abandon that wait to fail model that is so pervasive within education and particularly within literacy. So what we see, and I know that this is a trend that is replicated across the state and really across the country, are students moving up through the grade levels persistently behind. And we have to say as a district and frankly, as a country, this is not acceptable and this matters. So we're always putting the students first. And then the secondary driver for change is I'll piggyback off of what Monroe just brought up is that we have teachers coming into the profession and coming into the district from teacher preparation programs without having learned about evidence-based literacy instruction really at all. Um, and so many teachers only take one class on literacy instruction while in a licensure program, you know, particularly in undergrad. And statistically, it won't provide them with the research and evidence behind effective literacy instruction at all. Um, and even teachers in specialized programs like reading specialists, they're likely not learning about it either. And I was one of those teachers that went through and I, and I didn't really know anything about this until I got in the field. Everybody wants to do right by the students. So when you're in a higher ed program, there's an expectation that you're being provided factual information. And the reality is teachers are coming in unprepared to teach reading. And this isn't just the lower elementary K to three teachers, but all teachers because all teachers are teachers of reading, especially when we're struggling to close gaps and we see students in the upper grades and at the secondary level who are still unable to access the curriculum due to literacy gaps. And that's really a nicer way of saying that no one taught them how to read, but it's not for a lack of trying, right? 
So this drives districts like ours to question, what do we have to do to get everybody on the same page? How do we bring this knowledge to our teachers in a way that it can positively impact kids, in a way that ensures that every single student learns how to read and learns how to read early? All of this with a sense of urgency, right? And as Monroe spoke about and Kareem addressed, this is powerful. This is something that affects children for the rest of their lives. So in this way, this is a driver for change for us. We have to make sure that we're giving teachers the tools to do this and do it well and allocating our resources accordingly. Um, but right now, you know, we're working on it as a district, but we're really riding on a hamster wheel here, always trying to catch up. So as long as we continue on this path of inequity, we'll always be trying to catch up teachers, we'll always be trying to catch up kids, um, and, and the kids deserve better, and the teachers deserve better, right? Um, they deserve the opportunity, and they deserve the success. And so I'll kind of leave it with that, but it's, it's too important to not pay attention to. Great. Thank you, Jen. Appreciate that. It really does help us see how you all are sort of trying to implement these changes at, at the district level. So I want to circle back to a couple of questions for the panelists. While I'm doing that, um, if you're a member of the audience and you have a question you'd like to ask a panel member, please put it in the chat. Is that correct? Or the Q&A? Uh, people are monitoring that and will make sure that I see the questions that rise to the top. But here are my questions. So um, we have these this evidence of long-term positive and negative consequences. We, in here in Massachusetts, we're um, changing our early literacy standards. We're trying to mobilize uh, educator prep programs to change the approaches they're taking. What are the barriers? What what what's in our way from making these changes a reality? Is it a lack of knowledge? Is it capacity? Is it politics? Some combination of those. Kareem, you've you've been silent. Well, I was, I, you know, I was thinking about what Jennifer said. It was very powerful. Yeah. Um, Say more. But but well, you know, higher ed has a has a role to play in all of this, and I think we do ourselves a disservice by just focusing on pre K to twelve. Uh, that hamster wheel that she talked about, or that you know, is like a, a bucket, and the holes are in the bucket, you know. At a certain point in time, there's only so much professional development to go around in the K-12 space. And I can, having talked with superintendents and chief academic officers, they say, Kareem, we don't mind providing in-service. We just don't want to have to keep unteaching things. You know, whatever they learned in their pre-service program, we have to undo it. And that's withering. Um, hmm. And it's, it's um, and I understand that challenge. So universities really have to step up and make sure that they're providing the type of experiences and the knowledge base that, that folks need to get in there and do the job on day one. I think that's the, that's, that's the crux is when will they be ready? I think the assumption has been, well, when they get in there, we'll provide the framework, but then when they get in there, K-12 will help them figure it out. But when you have kids showing up, you, you're expecting a certain level of proficiency and mastery and dexterity with these uh, effective methods. Uh, up from the day your kid comes into class. And, and so, you know, we really, I think, have to make sure that the higher ed space and the folks are part of this conversation. Because the earlier question you um, asked about equity, it, without higher ed being involved, there is no equity. Because then you're leaving it up to whichever teacher, whichever principal, whichever parent, you know, has the resources, time, energy, bandwidth, and access to resource to provide the kids what they what they need. Sorry about that tangent, but I what she said was so powerful. I just wanted to make sure to be. Well, I think I think you've answered the question. Actually, at least one barrier is on the preparation side. I think Absolutely. is shifting the focus of the way we prepare people for equitable teaching uh, practices. But I want I want to make sure that that Monroe and Jen have a chance to answer the question. Are there other barriers that you perceive, either in your local context or? Uh, Monroe or here in Massachusetts, Jen? Uh, I would just say to build on that very quickly, um, I think there's also a role for higher education to help the leaders in our school districts to be more informed consumers of educational products, right? So it's one thing to talk about evidence-based, but what does that mean? And to be informed consumers, um, I, I, I I've just interacted with a lot of, you know, hardworking professionals who just didn't have that training 
or opportunity to learn about how to consume, be high, you know, uh, high quality consumer research. And I think um, that along with what um, Kareem mentioned would also be another way that higher education can be an important systemic um, actor in this work. And other, uh, go ahead, Jen. No, I was gonna say, I'll, I'll add to that a bit too, because you mentioned when you framed the question, you know, is one of the barriers capacity. And I want to empower all of the teachers that are here with us today and all of those of you that work with leading teachers that I would argue that that's not a barrier at all. Everybody has the ability to teach reading and teach it well if you have the knowledge and you have the tools. So it's up to us to not only remove the barriers of success that I spoke about at the beginning of this call for students, but also for teachers. And if you are leading teachers, then that that's part of your role as well. And as the curriculum coordinator and coach, you know, I have K to three teachers that come to me and say, you know, I have no idea how to teach reading or, or I'm not great at, at teaching reading. You know, I really, I really thrive with math and, and that's okay too, but we need to empower our teachers to take control of this, to give them the knowledge, to build that, you know, that thirst for change and that thirst for learning within our teachers, because without them, you know, none of this is going to happen. And if we continue this cycle of, you know, I, I don't know how to do this, or, you know, I'm not open to changing the way that I think about this, then we're not going to get anywhere at all, because it's our teachers that are making the most difference for our kids. Um, so we have to be building that capacity. But I think everybody has it, everybody can do it. And everybody can do it really well if we if we allow them to. So let me let me push on this a little bit more um, with a second question about what we're calling evidence-based literacy instruction and what, what the state of Massachusetts is expecting in terms of early literacy um, standards. Some people would look at this as yet another swing of the pendulum. You're looking at a guy who is very involved in reading first. So I just, I'll put that out there, trying very hard to, um, you know, 20 years ago, advocate for evidence-based literacy approaches. Is this another swing of the pendulum? Or um, is something, you know, is this just one more movement? And how is the conversation and movement around shifting literacy practices today different than it was 20 years ago? What is, what is unique about this point in time? Have we learned anything? That That's kind of what I want to get at. Anyone? I'm happy to to lean in here. Right. Um, so I've asked myself this question a lot. Like I've looked at the research and the findings behind reading first. And um, you know, I'll 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 start with a term that's been really popular the last several years, um, the science of reading. And um, unfortunately, in too many places that gets boiled down to just phonics. Um, that's not what it is. We didn't need a fancy new term to just, you know talk about phonics. Um, let, let's start with the idea of science. Science is not static. Um, you know, my favorite definition of science comes from a University of Pennsylvania professor named Damon Santolo, who calls it the development of intuitions about, or new intuitions about how the world works. And in no other field is science static, right? And so I think that's the first thing we need to keep in mind here, that we're constantly learning. Um, what we didn't know, I mean, there are things we didn't know 20 years ago right, uh, after National Reading Panel, after reading, you know, when Reading First was put out, we know a lot more about brain science. And I think the discussions about science of reading, popular ones, unfortunately drop that part. Um, I think our friends in higher education, as you know well, David, are much more nuanced about what we know and don't know, sort of the, the boundaries of our ignorance. I also um, think that sometimes our discussion gets flattened. So there's two parts here. There's the science of learning to read, and there's the science of teaching reading. They're related, but they're not exactly the same. And just because you understand the science of how a child learns to read, that doesn't necessarily tell you what to do with the specific child in front of you or a group of children, right? And who all, you know, your, your group may look very different from the group in the next classroom. And so that's where we need to have, you know, a robust conversation around what we know, what we need to learn. That's what all of these experimental studies are about to help fill out our understanding. Um, I think even the last few years, there's been some really um, important findings. I think the Reading for Understanding initiative, um, if you have not read Reaping the Rewards of Reading for Understanding, which was published in mid-2020, you are missing something big and important. Uh, we certainly are using it here in Charlotte. 
um, to ground our understanding of some of the other parts. I think the Knowledge Matters campaign and the work they're putting out around world knowledge, natural and, um, and, and science knowledge is important. But we also understand more today than we did before about the importance of oral language, listening comprehension, world knowledge, and um, decoding and word recognition, how all of that plays together um, with regards to reading comprehension. So we know a lot more than we did uh, during reading first. The question is, what are we gonna do about it? And are we really going to have a science of reading that treats reading seriously as a scientific endeavor, just like we do in medicine? And so we can't play science of reading. We have to really be serious about it because again, I mean, just think about the consequences that we talk about. Our kids are expecting the big people in their lives to get this right. And that means we're also gonna to have to elevate our conversation. And again, I just wanna um, say the institutions of higher education have an important role to play in this, not just in teacher preparation, but also in equipping educators for a lifetime of work where they're gonna to need to be able to grapple with this and interrogate and ask important questions based on you know, what the emerging science is, which will always be emerging, but also what they know as practitioners, because there's also such a thing as practice-based evidence. And I know Jen has it in spades. Actually, you answered a question that an audience member raised, which is who's going to use the term science of reading? We weren't, honestly, we weren't trying to avoid it. I think, um, Monroe described, you know, the the advances in the science of reading, I think, quite well, the Reading for Understanding initiative, which really took on uh, really comprehension, the development of comprehension and vocabulary and language development on into uh, secondary literacy levels. Um, and and uh, a, a costly and important um, set of research studies that have been uh, funded by the Institute for Education Sciences. So thank you. I also heard in your response, Monroe, the importance of translation, right? What we know from science, what we learned, for example, during COVID needed to be translated for most of us, right? Who are not epidemiologists or infectious disease doctors. We needed to understand, so what do I do? Um, to protect myself. And, and, and we're in that same place as we prepare um, teachers for the classroom and support teachers in the classroom. Other responses to that question about the pendulum swing and how do we avoid that? Yes, please, Kareem. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. So I, I would suggest that it's not a pendulum swing if you never fully do it. You know, we, um, you know, that, that is a common thing, you know, it goes back and forth over every 10, 20 years, whatever. But AFT, American Federation of Teachers, put out something years ago, 15, 20 years ago, that says these are the elements of an effective reading program. It's, it's on their website right now. You can go Google it and look it up. Strong core reading curriculum. Instructional merit materials aligned to the research. Uh, appropriate reading assessments. Timely in, uh, intensive intervention for struggling kids. Timely, meaning we're not doing the way to fail. We're, you know, we still got 31 states that allow for the discrepancy model. So that's a whole nother conversation we can talk about. And then high quality PD. God knows there's nothing on, on the earth worse than bad PD. So you got to have those five things and implement them fully. I go to districts all around the country and say, how many of these five do you have in place? At most, I hear two. Mm. We do two out of the five at best and then say there's a pendulum swing. Mm. It's not a swing. Do the things that we know work for kids. And then AFT is just reporting. They didn't just create these out of thin air. These are things that most scholars will say, yeah, you, you need to have those. So we need to actually align our systems and approaches to the research uh, that's going to get the best outcomes for kids, our best thinking at the time. You're right, it does evolve. But we got to at least try in earnest to do what we know works now or that we believe works now. So I would encourage everybody to go there, see where your district or your school or your system stacks up with those five things. Then we can talk about a pendulum swing. Powerful. Yeah, Jen. I want to link this question back to the question that you asked us previously about those barriers, because I actually think this is one of them, right? So when we're working with teachers, one of the barriers for teachers and wanting to change or wanting to learn is that it does very much to them, especially teachers that have been in the field for a while, it very much feels like that pendulum swinging, right? And so that's causing, you know, a lot of teachers who really do want to do right by the students to say, you know, this, this really isn't worth the investment of my time because I've done this before. And it, my time didn't pay off, right? They they changed it on me again as soon as I was comfortable. You know, there's that kind of 
us versus them, that, that they're in control, they're making us do all of these things. But I think we have to look at it as why are we so static as a field, right? When there are many other fields, we touched on the field of medicine, for example, that are constantly evolving. They're looking at the research, they're looking at the science as it comes out. And it's okay to say, we didn't know this 20 years ago, or I didn't know this yesterday, right? And now I'm learning something new, but we we can't afford to be static as a field like this and to continue to do the same things that we've been doing for 20 years because we feel like it's a pendulum swing. So even if it is, we have to ask ourselves, you know, why is the pendulum swinging, right? Is it because we're learning new information? And if that's the case, then it, it probably will swing back again because we're going to learn something new tomorrow in five years and 10 years and 20 years. We're still not going to be doing things the same way that we're doing right now because we have resources at our disposal. But we have to look at why is it swinging and can we get everybody on board with that swing because it's in the best interest of our students with the information that we have accessible to us right now. So earlier we talked about um, uh, how there is a perception that evidence-based literacy practices or the science of reading are antithetical to social justice uh, advocacy. I want to I want to talk about another phrase that many people raise, and that is that we often find ourselves um, creating a deficit model for as we think about differentiated approaches for children who need different things. And I wanna know how do you, how does effective preparation in evidence-based practices, early literacy practices support high expectations and an asset-based model um, so that we can kind of leave that behind that deficit model discussion um, that that doesn't become primary to our conversations about how we prepare teachers to serve all all students. Thoughts? Okay, I was a high school teacher, so my question: Did I ask the question correctly? I can jump in here, um, and I think this gets down to some of you know the pretty the pretty technical things, but when we're talking about that deficit model, what we're really talking about are low expectations for students based on our perception of what they can do, right? And if we're never raising the bar for those students, they're, we're never giving them the opportunity to show us what they're able to do with the effective instruction that we can provide them with direct, explicit, and systematic instruction. And so what we see for a lot of these subgroups, and you know, I'll include students with disabilities in that subgroup is, you know, we're going to set the bar for them low so that they can meet it, but we're not ever raising the bar for them and expecting all students to get there. And it doesn't mean that we're going to have, you know, every single student performing way above the benchmark, but how are they ever going to get there if we don't try and if we don't support them and kind of build that staircase in order to allow them to. But if we're looking at it from a deficit point of view, we're not holding them to that expectation nor ourselves for providing them the instruction that will get them there. And again, we're just, we're putting them on that hamster wheel with us then. And so we have to look at and value the differences within our students and know that within the context of evidence-based literacy instruction, there are ways to get all students there um, based on the assets that they do have without looking at, you know, what's going to keep them behind, if that makes sense. And so something I'm thinking of right off the top of my head is, you know, leveled literacy and leveled instruction, whether that's, you know, leveled books or leveled assessments, when we're holding students and we're not allowing all students to have access to high quality grade level literature and text, how are they ever going to learn how to read and respond and think about and talk about high quality grade level text if they're never having the opportunity to, to get in with those, right? So we're talking about moving away from levels and into programs and instructional formats that allow students, no matter what, to be able to access that kind of text and have those rich discussions. Um, you know, and if we never give students the chance to get there, then then quite frankly, they never will. So uh, thank you, Jen, I appreciate this. Steven Pinker, I think, was said, you know, ed education is about teaching skills and knowledge that children won't do on their own, right? I mean, essentially, that they, they can't do on their own. It requires education. Is it wrong to think that some children may need different things, even if they're in the same grade level? They may need different skill development, different amounts of support, different, uh, different access to content. Is that possible? Without, I mean, it, 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 
It's a genuine question. I'm not asking a loaded question. It's genuine. Kareem? You're an award-winning teacher, Kareem. Tell us what you think. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Look, I, so I taught a fourth, fifth, um, amongst many other grade levels. I, I taught a four or five combination class, bilingual, and we had probably about five different languages spoken in there. Arabic, Spanish, uh, English, fit, you, uh, just a bunch. It basically was a grab bag. And it took a little bit, no, no, it took more work. But what it also did was it freed me up from my biases. Uh, it, it, it forced me to not make assumptions in my instruction and to deal with the etymology of the, 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 um, the origin of language and how language was constructed and built and, and designed. And, and, and that opened it up for everyone. So sometimes we see this, we, we have this either or complex. We're either doing things in a rigorous way or we're dumbing it down for those kids. And I just wanna encourage anybody who's listening, based on my experience, it's actually the opposite. I can tell you that studying word origins and etymology and Latin and Greek roots, listen, the SATs never loved it anymore. <laughs> I mean, like that's good for all kids. And it also connected them oftentimes to what they already knew. It was able to build on their assets. So for example, if there's a kid who's uh, native language is Spanish and, and, I, and we break down the cognates of words like pulmonary and say, oh, well, pulmonis, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually affirming hmm. to, to really study and analyze the language and build it. I mean, we can term that the science of reading, that's one component of it, but it actually is affirming if done correctly. So we've got to get out of this mindset of that's sterilizing things. The, we're the artist. The paints are the paints that we, we we have to make sure that we're infusing the love and creativity that only educators can do, but that we're using the right materials and that we're, 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 we're uh, applying the right methodologies, I should say. And, and when we do that, you know, um, diversity can be an enriching thing. I'm not saying it's not challenging at times, it is. Yeah. But if handled properly, um, all students can, can, can benefit. I'm sure that's probably only half of the question that you asked, but that's no. that's a yeah. No, I I think it's very positive uh, description and and the fact that it draws from your own classroom description and I suspect many of our listeners find themselves in classrooms just like you described. So I appreciate that. What what advice would you give to listeners who are lis are, who are listening to this, maybe a bit skeptical about the science of reading? Or maybe even fearful about how they would change what they do or how they would change the way they're preparing. Um, the next uh, generation of educators. What what advice would you give them um, in order to really shift um, and to provide their candidates with the necessary skills to be effective teachers of reading? Given the context Claire set for us at the beginning, where we've got, like many states, uh, um, many children in need as it relates to literacy development. How do you help the skeptics, the fearful? Monroe, thoughts? I think, David, that we need to be mindful that what we're talking about here is complex behavior change. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's easy to sort of follow organizational inertia to do what you've always done because that's safe. And so I think as we think about um, essentially the, the path that we are trying to shape um, of giving more children in classrooms the opportunity to experience, you know, the very best of what we know works to help them um, be, become strong readers, right? Um, the, you know, the, the five things that Kareem talked about, um, the practices that Jen talked about, um, that we have to be as mindful about the process of complex behavior change, just as we are about um, the actual work as well. And so this does add another layer of work 
And so you could think about this at the state level. Um, you could think about this certainly at a district level. And it's you know true all the way down to the school level. Um, I mentioned uh, University of Pennsylvania professor Damon Centola. Um, I think he's done probably some of the best work on um, complex behavior change. And we just need to recognize that it can be scary to make these changes. And actually what Dr. Centola has found is that you actually need enough people around you that are also undertaking it um, for you to you know, step forward. And so I think the work is also to be mindful and to basically think about how do we create the spaces for people that want to take the risk. Um, and we need those first movers that are going to show the rest of the folks in the state of Massachusetts the way. So I, I do think recognizing that what we're talking about here is, is not simple change, not simple behavioral change, but it's complex behavioral change and really leveraging the best, I'm going to say the word, science that we have around complex behavior change at the same time that we're also trying to leverage the best that we know about the science of learning to read and the science of teaching reading. Monroe, you also answered another question that I was going to ask about the where the levers are. And you said at the state level, at the low, at the uh, district level, you know, at the in, in our case, the municipal level, and at the local level, and frankly, at the classroom level. I think um, that also opens up the opportunity for any of you to talk about what you're seeing in other parts of the country where you've seen success. So let me let me just say one more, make one more comment and then uh, have you reflect on whether you've seen these changes happening in other other parts of the country. But in Massachusetts, pre-pandemic, for a long time, we had very good achievement outcomes for our state as a whole. But Claire and others will tell you that that wasn't true for all kids, right? Those achievement outcomes were masking um, inequities in many of our districts. Um, and the pandemic and what we've seen now, the, the data Claire reported at the outset of our conversation, is only has only exacerbated those, those challenges. So if there are people listening who are saying, you know, why change when we've had good outcomes? The outcomes weren't good for everyone, right? That is really important for us to face um, in our in the Commonwealth, I think. Um, so other things you've seen around the country that you would have us pay attention to um, that are happening, you would say this is this is change that's meaningful. And um, and I, I would ask Kareem and Monroe both, but Jen, I know you probably have extensive professional development networks. So any of you. Jen, if you'd like to go first, by all means, I'll jump in after. I was thinking about when Monroe was speaking, if anyone has ever seen the video of the dancing guy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so um, I'm not going to bore you with the details. It's pretty, it's actually just a dancing guy, but, you know, type it in on YouTube and you all can watch it after this call. But um, in a sense, it's it's what what starts a movement of change, right? And so when I think about the networks that I share people around the country, you know, I see some really powerful leaders there, some leaders of change that represent that, you know, one dancing guy that are taking that risk. And it doesn't have to be somebody in a leadership role. It could be a teacher in a classroom. It could be a parent in the community. It could be, you know, the students themselves, but it really does take just one person. So my piece of advice as I reflect on the last question and link it to this one is what works really well is having a strong voice and a powerful leader and somebody willing to take that risk and that can bring other people on board with them. And that can start to spark this movement of change. So if you're on this call and you're you know, worried about making that change within your classroom or your community, go ahead and do it, be that dancing guy. And you might be surprised at, at what's to follow because without that first guy, nothing is ever going to happen. So I, I think that I see powerful leaders everywhere that I admire. Um, and I think that they really are starting that change. Thank you. That's good. I'll, I'll follow up quickly. Um, Erica Sponberg in the chat asked a question in the Q&A. She asked for districts within Massachusetts and other places, other states that are improving literacy. And I gave her a link to a podcast by Ed Trust. It's called Extraordinary Districts, or no, Ordinary Districts 
doing extraordinary things. There's something, something like along those lines. They've got about five or six seasons now, and they take you through the story of these individual districts, the principals, the parents, the community, the schools, the curriculum, the choices, the decisions they made to go from being very, very low in terms of reading achievement to very, very high. I would encourage everyone to check that out. It's one of the most lightly um, practiced podcasts I've ever seen to be so to be so good. And hopefully somebody can can put that in the chat for us. But but there are examples of success. Nothing moves educators like examples of success. When you get when you've been around a while and you've seen initiatives come and go, very little can move you until you see it. And I would encourage everybody to also, in addition to listening, if you're in a position of leadership or you just want to see it for yourself, your own eyes, go visit some places. We, we just, uh, Fulcrum, we just sent a group to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to see a group of schools really doing well using the curriculum that, that Oakland has adopted. Go see it. Yeah. Go see it. Then you can get past some of these ideological barriers and questions if people just experience success and then lift up those examples for others. Kareem, one of the one of the obstacles during the Reading First era was all about materials, mm -hmm. right? And you mentioned earlier selection of the right materials is important. And um, this came up as a question from the audience too. Any brief thoughts about that? Like Absolutely, glad you asked. Um, so publishers understand that districts are not very critical consumers. They know that if they throw things in a box and they check enough of the things on the checklist that they're on the, on the docket. Decision makers have to make sure what they're doing is usable. Usability is the number one key. So you tell me how much prep time you have on your contract, I'll tell you what, what are the different curricular options you should be considering. And it, the, the mismatch is so extreme at times is because people aren't plugged into how these things fall on educators. So yes, we wanna make sure that these things are synthesized. That means the oral language development and the writing and all these things, in addition to the five components you mentioned earlier, but that it's also doable and manager and manageable. It's not about waiting for Superman or Superwoman. It's creating a system that regular people can do on a day in day out basis. So that, that's what I'll say about high quality materials. Um, what's the name of that company? Student Achievement Partners, they've got something. I'll put it in the chat and maybe someone can elevate it a little bit later. Um, but, but, but yeah, that's key. So, uh we could keep talking, but we've near we are nearing the end of our conversation. I want to thank Kareem Weaver, Monroe Richardson, and, and uh, Jennifer Hogan for joining us and for being candid and clear and passionate about the work you do. Audience members, thank you so much for joining us. I know that each of these people can be uh, um, accessed through their websites and would be happy to be a partner in the work that you do in your own change within your higher ed program or your um, or your schools. So thank you so much, Claire. I'm going to turn it back to you to uh, close out the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I just want to acknowledge um, we could not get to every question. Um, David and I did our best to synthesize the themes and the topics that um, you all raised. And um, so apologies if we didn't get to a specific question that you were dying to have answered. Um, but I, I do hope that um, you found that the conversation as engaging and, and informative as, as we as it was. Um, I just want to express my enormous gratitude to our panelists as well, Kareem Weaver, Monroe Richardson, and Jennifer Hogan, um, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. There is obviously both um, urgency, but also a lot of opportunity to this work um, of ensuring that all students, particularly those that have been historically marginalized, can read and write and fully engage in our society. Um, this is only the beginning of our conversation, however. There were several questions in the chat about multilingual uh, instruction and how we support um, our, our multilingual students. So if you haven't done so already, I encourage you all to register for the remaining two webinars in the series. On April 4th at 3 p.m., uh, Dr. Nicole Harris from Salem State University will lead a conversation around culturally responsive practices in early literacy with panelists, including Dr. Tracy White Whedon, Africa Fetty Mills, and the 2022 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year finalist, Ashley Coerge. So a link uh, to register, I think, is already in the chat. And then um, finally, on April 10th, 
Dr. Claudia Rinaldi from LaSalle University will lead our final conversation around early literacy instruction for multilingual learners, with panelists including Dr. Claude Goldenberg, Dr. Christina Buddy, and Massachusetts teacher Mandy Hollister. And we will place a link to uh, register for that webinar in the chat as well. So thank you again for joining us, everyone. It was an honor um, and have a wonderful afternoon. Take thank you, care. everyone. Bye now. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.